several decades ago, a visit to a garment factory in Los Angeles changed my life and set me on a path of research and activism I remain passionate about today. I've become interested in globalization and the most globalized industry in the world today is the apparel industry. And just down the road in Los Angeles, 150,000 garment workers labored in thousands of factories, barely a mile from the towering offices and banks and hotels of Bunker Hill. This industry had been described as a sweatshop industry. The workers there were all immigrants, mainly from Mexico and Central America, mainly women, most of them undocumented. So I decided to go down and take a look. The factory I visited was an eye opener. It was the top floor of a six story building that had seen much better days as an office building. Now it was home to dozens of factories and hundreds of workers. As I entered the elevator, I sensed that something was missing. What was missing was a door on the elevator. There was no door. As we ascended to the sixth floor, I realized something else was missing. There were no lights in the elevator. As we went up facing an open elevator shaft in darkness, I could only wonder what it was like when this elevator was crammed full of garment workers heading to their factories. The factory itself wasn't much different. It was small, it was crowded, it was noisy and dirty, and the women, maybe 30 of them, who worked in this factory couldn't look up from their sewing machines because they had quotas to meet. I noticed that there were bolts of fabric that blocked every possible exit, making me wonder what if there were a fire. And the bathroom. Well, I'll spare you the details. Let's just say the one toilet that served two floors of factories was completely stopped up and overflowing. Now, this factory was part of a corporate accountability program, something called the Compliance Alliance, a voluntary agreement by the brands that produce garments and contract factories in Los Angeles to monitor themselves, to hire firms to go in and make sure these factories were OK. The brands and retailers that produce in LA did not want the US Department of Labor or the California Division of Labor Standards Enforcement breathing down their throats. So they said, we'll do it ourselves. It was becoming evident to me that this program of corporate responsibility was not working very well. So I asked myself the question, which I really pursued ever since, why does corporate accountability fail and what can be done about it? So let's take two examples, one high tech, one low tech, to sort of orient ourselves to this issue. High tech, Apple. So Apple sources the components for its smartphones all over East Asia, some from the US. iPhones are assembled in giant factories throughout the world, mainly in South China, Foxconn, the world's largest manufacturer of uh, smartphones and computers for every major brand, employs over 1.2 million workers. It is a safe bet that not one of the 212 million iPhones sold in the world last year was actually made by Apple. All were made and assembled in contract factories. Or let's go low tech, Zara. You're all familiar with Zara, the popular clothing brand, a popular brand owned by Inditex, the giant Spanish corporation. I don't mean to pick on Zara, but I'm going to use this as illustrative. If you were to look, we don't have time in this setting, in the back of your shirt, you would see that the labels represent a United Nations of production. Every country in the world makes clothing, with China and Bangladesh leading the pack. It is a safe bet that not one of the garments any of us are wearing today were actually made by the brands that we so covet. So to get a better understanding of this, let's go back to the 20th century. This is the Chevy Impala, by the way, the iconic car of my youth in the 1950s. 
produced by General Motors, the largest corporation in the world in the 1950s. Huge, powerful corporation. Produced cars, trucks, light vehicles in-house, employing hundreds of thousands of workers in the United States, some outsourcing to other countries, but mainly done General Motors workers and General Motors factories. The workers in these factories had some power. General Motors might have been a powerful corporation, but the workers belonged to the United Automobile Workers Union. Every couple of years when contracts came up for negotiation, if the workers didn't get what they want, they would go out on strike. And eventually, beginning after World War II and up through the 1970s, this form of industrial production enabled blue collar workers in the US and Europe to achieve middle class status, send their kids to college, maybe get a home in the suburbs. I call this the 20th century social contract. And in this diagram, you can see big corporation represented by General Motors, big labor, the AFL-CIO, and above it, the state as the enforcer, the umpire. Not a perfect arrangement, not all workers benefit, but in the industrial sector, it meant basically a way into the middle class. Now let's go to the 21st century. Walmart is the largest corporation in the world today. Walmart is a retailer. Walmart doesn't make anything. Rather, it carries thousands of brands. Those brands don't make anything either. Like Apple and Zara, they source their production from pretty much everywhere in the world. In this arrangement, the workers have almost no power at all. If the workers demand higher wages in a factory in Bangladesh, for example, or well, the brand that's using that factory will just move down the street or maybe move to another country entirely. If workers try to unionize, well, when I was in Bangladesh two years ago, I met with two labor organizers who had been detained by the police and tortured. The year before, Bangladesh's leading union organizer, Amin al-Islam, had been detained and murdered. I call this the 21st century corporate agreement. It's really, it's corporate accountability agreement. It's not a formal contract like the 20th century. This is the arrangement that defines global production today. You have a big business emblemized here by Walmart. That business hires a factory independently owned to make something for which it has no legal liability and then hires a monitoring firm to go into the factory, see what's happening, and report back. It is entirely internal to the corporate process. Missing from this picture are two key actors that were present in the 20th century. Organized labor in the form of unions to represent the interests of workers and the state to enforce the deal. So how well has this worked out? I think you can anticipate my answer. It hasn't worked out very well at all. Let's go high tech again. Foxconn, the giant Taiwanese company I mentioned earlier. Um, in 2010, 2011, this factory in Shenzhen, China employed half a million workers. 18 workers, mainly young women, jumped to their deaths, despondent over low wages, long working hours, miserable conditions. Foxconn responded by putting up the nets you see in this picture to catch the women. That, shall we say, insensitive response caught the attention of a young woman named Jenny Chan who worked in a tiny non-governmental organization in Hong Kong. Jenny and her friends infiltrated the factory, found out how Foxconn had responded, went to the news media. The New York Times ran a series. It became viral on social media and Apple which like all corporations is extremely sensitive about image. Brands live and die by their image. Apple got involved and eventually wages went up and working conditions improved. Now, the workers didn't get everything that Jenny Chan, or for that matter, I would have liked them to have gotten. But they did get something. And this shows what a single person with consumer pressure behind her can do to make a difference and hundreds of thousands of lives. 
in these factories. All right, let's go low tech. Let's go from Apple to Zara, so to speak, to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the most dangerous place in the world to be a factory worker. Since the industry began moving there from China, when wages went up in China 10, 15 years ago, more than 2,000 workers have died in fires and building collapses. I won't go over the details in this slide, but this highlights just four examples of buildings where fires or collapses had claimed lives. Every one of these factories had been monitored by an independent monitoring firm and given a clean bill of health. As you look at this slide, you'll recognize Walmart, H&M, these are well-known brands, but none of these brands made the garments. They were made in places with names like Tezreen or Gari Bengari, places I had certainly never heard of. All right, let's go to Rana Plaza. How many of you had heard of Rana Plaza? How many of you had heard of Rana Plaza before April 24th, 2013? That's a trick question, because I certainly hadn't. Rana Plaza is an industrial building in near Dhaka, Bangladesh, in the Savar Industrial District. Its first floor housed offices and banks and things like that. But Mr. Sohel Rana, who owned the building and was well-connected with the ruling party in Bangladesh, added a bunch of floors without benefit of architects or engineers or permits or anything like that to house dozens of factories employing thousands of workers. On April 23rd, 2013, cracks appeared in the first floor. Building was vacated and inspected. On April 24th, 2013, nobody returned to work on the first floor. But the thousands of garment workers milling outside were ordered by the factory owners to report to work or lose their jobs. Mr. Rana himself stood outside the factory and said, this building will be standing for 100 years. Exactly one hour later, the building collapsed. The top floors pancaked onto the lower floors. Thousands of workers were trapped in the rubble. Over 1,100 died. 2,000 were injured. Amputations were performed without anesthetic on the spot to extract workers. The worst industrial disaster that we know of, factory disaster, and certainly in the garment industry and history. Once again, this building and the factories in it had all been inspected under corporate responsibility programs. Well, you may be wondering, why do workers take these jobs? Well, they take these jobs because as dangerous as they are, they're better for these workers than the alternatives. And maybe workers are better off over time taking these jobs. To explore these questions, my students and I, including undergraduates and graduate students at UCSB, did a study for the Center for American Progress, where we looked at the wages in the apparel industry in the 15 countries that export the most apparel to the United States, comparing wages in 2001 and 2011. We wondered if maybe wages had gone up over this 11-year period once you took into account the effects of inflation in this sector. What we found, actually, is that wages went down in two-thirds of these factories over this period. And we also found that, with no exception, did wages come close to approximating a wage that workers could live on, a living wage. In fact, wages were typically a quarter to a fifth of a living wage. So clearly, it seems to me, corporate responsibility has not worked. So what can be done? Well, one thing I think that can't be done is to let the fox guard the chicken coop. I don't have to finish the phrase, but you know the chickens get eaten when that happens. So I'm going to point out, by way of conclusion, three things that hold promise. First, after the Rana Plaza collapse, it was so truly horrific that the firms that operate in Bangladesh, and I put up a list of them here, pretty much every major firm, got together under pressure from unions and activists and created something called the Accord on Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh. It is precedent setting because for the first time, to my knowledge, in the global, any global industry, the brands and retailers that hire independently owned contract factories have agreed to inspect these factories, 
and make sure they are repaired and pay for the repairs if necessary and make this agreement legally enforceable. This establishes what I call the principle of joint liability. It does away with the fiction that the brands that use factories have no legal obligation because the factories are independently owned. Now, two firms didn't want to sign this because they didn't like the implication that they might be legally bound, setting a precedent. So Gap and Walmart created their own agreement called the Alliance for Worker Safety, which is not legally binding, obligates nobody to pay anything, and has been signed by a couple of dozen firms. Under the accord, some 1,500 factories have been expected, 110,000 violations have been found, half of which have been corrected, and 150 factories have been closed as simply untenable. And now the heavy lifting begins to see if the other factories can be fixed up. That leads me to the second point. Workers. Workers around the world are not quiescent and passive. They are active. So in, Rana, so in Bangladesh, after the Rana Plaza collapse, 70,000 workers took to the streets and demanded higher wages. The spotlight was on Bangladesh at this moment. The world was watching. The brands that produce in Bangladesh, H&M, all the companies that are there, put huge pressure on the Bangladesh government to respond, and wages went up 71%. Workers got a 71% wage increase. That brought wages in Bangladesh up to about a quarter of a living wage, by the way. Now, I don't mean to suggest that Bangladesh is a worker's paradise. Last month in December, workers went out on strike again, some 50,000 workers. The result was thousands lost their job and the government jailed a couple hundred union organizers. The difference is the world is not watching now. The spotlight is not on Bangladesh. Which brings me to the third approach, which involves all of us as consumers. The reason that Jenny Chan was successful in focusing attention on Foxconn was because the news media picked it up and consumers got involved. Um, the reason that um, the protests after Rana Plaza were successful was that the world was watching. So it's up to us to make the world watch, and I want to give you one example where this has worked in the university sector, which applies to many of the students here today. So students across the United States over the years have formed organizations and put pressures on their campuses to make sure that anything, for example, that is sold in the bookstore here the, with the El Gaucho on it or with UCSB on it, is made under a code of conduct that protects the workers throughout the supply chain that make it. I put up a couple of provisions of the code of conduct here. Transparency, the name and address of every factory in the supply chain, so independent monitors, such as the Worker Rights Consortium, which was created to oversee this, can go into those factories. The payment of a living wage, and most important in my view, the right of workers in these factories to form a union to argue over their own wages, what they think is fair. And I'm proud to say that I was on the committee and the office of the UC president that drafted our original code of conduct, and I'm on the committee which is strengthening that code today, with support, I should add, from the business people from all 10 campuses. There are other things you can do. I put up some things here, fair trade, not perfect, we don't really know how far down the supply chain the fairness goes, or is it just ecological, but a start. Looking for a union label. Apps for your smartphone, such as Good Guide, which you can download for free and which lists thousands of brands and everything that's known about them in terms of labor and environmental practices. And finally, you can buy from a company that actually does the right thing. One such company is called Alta Gracia. It's in the Dominican Republic. Workers are fully unionized and they are paid three and a half times the prevailing wage in Dominican Republic. And you can buy Alta Gracia products in the UCSB bookstore as well as other college campuses. Finally, just to repeat, student activism. Students have been in the forefront of putting this on the agenda really for the last 15 to 20 years. There's a local chapter of United Students Against Sweatshops, as you can see from this picture. It's a lot of fun and it is a way for students to make a difference, and I'd be happy to talk to any students in this room about how to get involved. So let me just conclude 
by reminding us, as we learned from the Civil Rights Movement, it doesn't take millions of people to make a difference. It takes a small group of committed people. The quote from anthropologist Margaret Mead always inspires me. Never think that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can't make a difference. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. It is really incumbent on all of us to reach out and do something to make a difference in the lives of the people who make all the stuff we enjoy every day. Thank you.